Uh, well, this is going to be an interview with Professor Jean Franklin of Stanford University. And I think I would like to ask, start by asking Jean about uh, a little bit how you got involved in control in life and what your background is. Okay. Well, uh, I'm from Western North Carolina. And uh, I really got started in electronics by, uh, at the invitation of the United States Navy. When, uh, when, when I was uh, getting uh, 18, this was still uh, subject to the draft in World War II. And the best deal at the time was, uh, was, was called the Captain Eddie Radio Stewart. And so I went, I went to, uh, to that, I just out of high school. But they were teaching us electronics, they were teaching us uh, all kinds of, uh, of uh, that sort of stuff. And in fact, uh, then I, after I finished the school, I went back, I was called back as an instructor. I'd sort of always known I liked to teach. And, and the Navy uh, uh, was good enough to uh, take me back to Great Lakes as an instructor. And uh, one of my uh, colleagues there was Jack Bertram, who was, who was also in the, uh, in the Navy at that time, in the, same, uh, in the same school. So he followed the same path as you? He followed the yeah. same path yeah. uh, into, into engineering. And uh, the textbooks that we were using at that time, remember now, I was just out of high school, was Fred Terman's book on uh, radio engineering. But uh, we, uh, we were learning all about uh, that sort of stuff. Anyway, then when I, uh, when I got out of the Navy, um, I, I didn't want to continue in, in engineering, so I went to uh, Georgia Tech. And uh, I graduated from Georgia Tech. It turned out that this was in 1950 when there were uh, a lot of returning veterans in the United States. Oh, and incidentally, let me just uh, make the comment that the reason I was even able to go to school was because of the GI Bill, which, which was one of the greatest uh, contributions I think the U.S. government ever made, was uh, allowing all the veterans to, uh, to go back to college that wouldn't have been able to perhaps. Did you study electrical engineering, Georgia Tech? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I was in electrical engineering. And, uh, and then, when I, when I, by when I graduated, it was in June of 1950, and the Bureau of Labor Statistics had come out with a, uh, an article saying that the country had uh, twice as many engineers as the economy was able to absorb. So there were, there were very few jobs, but I got a, a fellowship to MIT. So, uh, so I went up there. And uh, while I was at uh, uh, MIT getting my master's degree, uh, working on transistors, as a matter of fact, which had just then come out at the very beginning, but uh, uh, after I got my master's there, again, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to be able to do. And uh, John Russell from Columbia came up, and they were recruiting uh, uh, new instructors. And they had a deal whereby you could teach at Columbia and work on your degree at the same time. So uh, uh, we went down to, uh, to Columbia. I got married by that time. And we went down to Columbia, and it was just uh, fortuitous when I got there. John Ragazzini had this research program going in, uh, in control. And uh, so I was teaching uh, an electronics course at Columbia, but uh, signed on with, with Ragazzini to, uh, to, to work in control. Let me ask you about MIT. What, what teachers were around at MIT at the time in the 50s when you were there? That made okay. you impression. Sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the one in terms of my own uh, research and uh, later work, that was most, uh, most important was uh, uh, Lee, by Lee, yeah, yeah. who was Wiener's oh, yeah, okay, uh, okay. colleague. Yeah, you know, yeah. And he taught the Wiener filter, you know, just from the, from the original, yeah. the solving yeah. of the Wiener Hoff equation by uh, spectral factorization. And so we learned all of that. And, and, and I also uh, learned the sort of the mathematics and circuits from Ernie Gilman. Okay. okay. Who was yes. who was there teaching teaching the, the, the circuit uh, theory stuff? So uh, we learned about Ralph's criteria and Ralph Hurwitz yeah. and, and, and and all of that and, and Cowher's uh, realization and so on. So we got a good background in sort of mathematical circuit theory. From him. Was Jack Burton also at MIT or did he go? No, to, he went a different path. He when he left uh, the Navy, yeah. I lost track of him. Yeah. Okay. And I he see. went to uh, Washington University in St. Louis. I see. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and then I went to, uh, and then after he left Washington University, uh, he went to work at, uh, at uh, DuPont yeah. in Wilmington yeah. as, a, as a control engineer. Yeah. Okay. And uh, then Rudy Kalman was at MIT and left without his doctorate and also went to DuPont yeah. in Wilmington. Yeah. Okay. Well, it turned out that John Ragazzini was a consultant in control at Wilmington. 
And so he told these guys that, uh, hey, you shouldn't be spending your time in, uh, in, in DuPont. You should come to, uh, you should come to Columbia. So I'm teaching this course one day, then comes what? Jack Burchett from... Uh, he comes to your from, class. From LA, he comes to my class uh, in, in electronics. Uh, did Kahneman also go to your class? No, he really? didn't, uh, didn't take my class. But uh, uh, also at uh, Columbia at that time, uh, John Ragazzini was, uh, was teaching controls courses. Uh, Jack Milman was teaching electronics. And Lafizzati... Was that the Milman in the Milman talk book? Yes. Yeah, okay, so, yeah. He was a physicist yeah. from, from MIT yeah. and had taught for many years at City College in, in New York. But then he had come down to, uh, to Columbia and teaching the teaching electronics. Um, and so Ragazzini then had a, uh, had a, uh, a contract looking at uh, uh, sample data uh, controls. I'm not absolutely sure how John got started in that, although uh, I believe that it was from, from World War II trying to look at reconstructing uh, aircraft target, uh, an aircraft uh, path based upon search radar data. You know, where the search yeah, radar is there. Yeah, you sample data. You sample yeah. the data. So, yeah. so your information is inevitably sampled. And the question is, how do you reconstruct uh, the, the trajectory? And this, of course, begins with, uh, with estimation, with just, you know, extrapolation in the meaner sense. And, uh, and so since I had uh, Lee's course at MIT, and, were the expert. and knew about, yeah, yeah. Uh, knew about Wiener filtering and all the continuous stuff, yeah. uh, I volunteered yeah. to uh, add the sample data constraint and, and to do that. And so that was, that was what my thesis yeah. uh, turned out to be. So, well, when did you get your thesis? What year? 55. Okay. And your book on sample data with Ragazzini came out very shortly, very shortly afterwards. It was, yeah, it was published in 58. Oh, what? What happened was, uh, when I got my, after I finished my degree, uh, the, the Ragazzini's first student in this area was Eli Jury, yeah. who left and went to Berkeley. Okay. And uh, when I got my degree, uh, they asked me if I would uh, accept an appointment as assistant professor, okay. which I agreed to. Yeah, <laughs> at Columbia. At Columbia. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I stayed on to teach, and, and, and my research uh, uh, responsibilities were to help John with this book. Okay. Okay. And so we talked a course, yeah. uh, 209, yeah. in uh, sample data theory, yeah. and we're busy writing the book. Uh, that was probably the first course in sample data theory in the Western world. Or... Uh, it was it was pretty close. Yeah. There was a uh, uh, there was a paper, I think it was in the AIWE, okay, by Bill Linville from yes. MIT, okay, on, uh, on, on on sample data stability oh, yes. using the Nyquist uh, okay. criteria. Okay. You know, where you uh, you take the continuous one, and then you would add. You know, you, you, you add write, all the as the, a summation. Yes, you can yes, write yes. the the spectrum yep. of a sample yep. system yep. as an infinite yep. sum. And Lindo was suggesting adding them up. Yep. And, and Ragazzini and Zali wrote a reply to that, yep. saying that you should actually go to the z-plane yep. and do this in the unit yep. circle, and yep. everything is uh, much much more complete yep. and simple. And that I think is what got them got them started. And they uh, they, they wrote uh, for you got proposals and got some research. So Zadi and, and Ragazzini were collaborators on, 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 on that. But, but then, of course, uh, Jack Burton joined the group, uh, and he did his thesis on quantization. Yeah. And uh, Rudy Kalman uh, joined the group, and he was looking at nonlinear and time variant yeah. things. And Phil Sarachik and George Kratz, and, there was a, and, and Jack Sklansky. There was a whole... Yeah. Crew of us, of course, all in one big bullpen with uh, Dilbert uh, cubicles yeah. <laughs> uh, there on uh, on Broadway and uh, 116th Street. You know, many of us have heard, you know, very nostalgic stories about the spirit of Colombia at the time. I mean, you had this powerful group of people who were turning up these fantastic new results. Can you tell a bit, little bit about, you know, the atmosphere at the lab and uh, how you were working and what made it so great? Uh, it's you know, it, it's always hard, I think, yeah. to to uh, get the, something like that. I, the, uh, the the guiding spirit of the whole thing was John Ragazzini. Okay. I don't think there's yeah. any doubt about that. Yeah. And, and he, but his his philosophy was, you know, posing the problems, getting people together, and then uh, yeah. letting them go off. And, uh, so he was a great. Work. He was a great leader. He was a great leader. Yeah. And uh, you know, 
as I say, uh, Bertram and uh, and Kalman and yeah. George Krantz and, and everybody was around all talking yeah. about the, yeah. the, and Bernie Friedland. Oh yes, yes. Uh, talking about uh, the problems that they were working yeah. on. And, and, uh, so very so intense, also, very very intense, intense interaction. interaction yeah. yeah, there was a lot of interaction. Yeah. And also the fact that you were in very close proximity. That's right. Yeah. We were all thrown in right together there, as I say, in one big bullpen uh, sort of uh, sort of area. Yeah. And, and I was teaching courses, and, and Jack and I, Bertram and I, uh, ran the control zone. Yeah. And what we did was we threw out all the 50 kilowatt uh, machines yeah. down in the basement and replaced them with little servo motors, you know, the uh, FPE 25 and yeah. so on. Uh, uh, and they made a servo mechanism. And uh, as part of the contract, in fact, Ragazzini uh, had, had constructed a, uh, a special analog computer to simulate uh, sample data. Oh, yeah. okay. uh, the, the sampling was done with a motor driving a can. Okay. And we had little micro switches okay. that, would, yeah. uh, that, would, that would do the sampling. And we had, as I recall, something like five operational amplifiers. Each of them taking up five inches high, yeah. 19 inches wide <laughs> uh, of, of this yeah. uh, rack space. Yeah. And we had uh, power supplies in the basement that were plus and minus 300 uh, volts that would kill you if you yeah. got across it. I mean, they were putting out amperes and that yeah. Million. Yeah. But that was the that was the analog yeah. computer. You know, patch boards yeah. on the front. We could uh, hook up and make simple. We could control one over s squared. You yeah. Know, oh yeah. <laughs> with uh, with the sample data control. Yeah. Fantastic. But, uh, but it was that was the it's so old environment there. It was, you know, uh, were you there when Kornman wrote this paper on, on, on self-tuning regulators, which he implemented on one of these devices? Were you there at the time? Or uh, he did that at DuPont. Oh, I see. He did that at DuPont. Yeah, he did that at DuPont. Okay. Okay. And in fact, I should have looked it up before we started this conversation, but I, 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 I'm not sure exactly what epoch, you know, where okay. in the... In oh, the I see. Period, okay. But, okay. But he, he so he did, did that, that before he came to... Before I believe so. Okay. I Thank believe you. so. That uh, you know, doing least squares estimation oh, yes, exactly. and, and uh, linear quadratic uh, uh, control. Yeah. And in fact, I remember I, was, I, was, I thought about you. I remember one time after he was looking at some of that, he was asking me if I knew of a case where the least squares estimate was biased. Yeah. <laughs> he, okay. you know, not yeah. understanding no, okay. the, uh, okay. the way the yeah. uh, the way these things interacted yeah. when you put them in. Uh, but that was really the first self tuning regulator, yeah. wasn't yes, it? Yes, it was. It was. Yeah. Which, you know, I wanted to ask you another thing about sample data. So, so I think uh, your course, that, were there any other universities in the United States at the time who also started to look at sample data theory? Or Not that I know Okay, so, so this was really the birthplace, this, this, birthplace this, of sample data right. theory. It, well, now, I should, I should say that uh, Eli Jury got his thesis, I believe, in 54. Yeah. I got mine in 55. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Eli went to Berkeley, oh, yeah, okay. you see, and, and then Jury's book came out just after ours. Oh, yes. So okay. He was teaching uh, sample the data time. at Berkeley. But in a certain sense, it originated. It originated, from it, from it originated from Columbia, then That's it spread right. to Berkeley when... That's when right. Of course, I got it as that. soon as I came to, uh, to Stanford in 57. Yeah. Let's talk about this. I mean, here you were sitting at Columbia as an assistant yeah. professor. And of course, Columbia at that time had an extremely good reputation. Yes. And then yes. you made the big leap to the West Coast. Yes. So I uh, would be interested to hear about, I mean, why, why you did this and also the perception of Stanford at the time. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, I must admit, it was, it was more, more personal than yeah. professional in, okay. in some respects. A nice Carl. climate, though. Right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I, let me, let me uh, admit that, that my wife had a major impact in this decision as well. Okay. <laughs> uh, she hated New York City. Okay. You know, we had we had two small kids yeah. at this time. You know, yeah. and we lived right on Amsterdam Avenue. Okay. You know, which is a, yeah. which makes El Camino look like a country road. Yeah. You know? it's, <laughs> uh, it's just constant yeah. uh, traffic and so on, and just a very just a huge city. We were yeah. on the fifth floor of yeah. the tenth floor building and so on. And and also uh, Gertrude is from Maine. Yeah. You know? And uh, in the summer of uh, fifty six. Uh, I can remember in our apartment it was 95 degrees at 2 o'clock in the morning. Oh. You know, and it's about 98% humidity, yep. you know, yep. you're lying there sweating. Yep. We, we, we finally went off up to her home in Maine yep. where it was cool enough to do some work. Yep. You know, your brain yep. fries yep. and find it like that. Anyway, uh, it, the way I uh, got the offer, it turns out that Lottie knew John Linville. Okay. And John Linville had been one of my instructors at MIT. Okay. And Linville had come to uh, to Stanford because uh, Fred Terman, who was the uh, dean of engineering yeah, yeah. here, 
uh, realized that, uh, that you had to get into solid state. Stanford had always had a good reputation in uh, vacuum tube fabrication, okay. yes, electronic yes. devices fabrication. They made, uh, they made uh, tubes, the Idle McCullough yep. company yep. was uh, just up the yep. road here making transmitter tubes and that kind of thing. And he realized that to go into solid state, and so he recruited John Lindbergh from Bell Labs. And then they wanted to add someone, and at that time Lockheed had decided to set up their ballistic missiles division in Sunnyvale. Okay. Okay. They had decided to come to, uh, to Northern California, sort of as one of the very early, if not the earliest, significant so, well, I guess they were after very, but one of the early residents of the Stanford Industrial Park too, was Lockheed. Was Lockheed. Yeah. And Lockheed were in the missile business, and they said that we need courses in control for our engineers. And so, Sherman set Linville on the task of finding a controlled engineer. And they wanted to find the one that knew the less about big machines as far as I can tell. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, uh, as I heard the story, John Linville called Lockheed. Yeah. And Lockheed said, well, you could, I'd interview some of these guys in Ragazzini School. Yeah. And, uh, and John knew me from MIT. Yeah. So he came and, and interviewed, and they flew us out here. Okay. Yeah. What time of the year? This was July. Ah. <laughs> As I said, it was yeah, like yeah. You know, 95 yeah. degrees. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, uh, Gertrude uh, was not, she, it wasn't that she didn't like cities, she liked an urban yeah. Uh, yeah. area. And so we agreed to meet her in San Francisco. Yeah. And so we, we uh, after I had interviewed her and talked to her during the day, mm -hmm. we went up to meet her, and she's freezing, of course, because yeah. she has on her New York dress, yeah, yeah. and it's about 60 degrees, yeah. <laughs> and she says, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so the, the domestic decision was, uh, uh, was, was easy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But, uh, but then they, you know, Stanford, of course, uh, made a, a very attractive offer in yeah. terms of uh, the, the housing on the yeah. campus, uh, and then the salary yeah. was good. And, and so on, and so uh, I told Ragazzini that I was going to Cal. Okay. Yeah. What did he say? Uh, he was a little bit upset. Yeah. Yeah. Bit upset. Okay. We hadn't quite finished the book yet, okay. so I, you I finished, I, it I finished my section here. Yeah. When I was, when I and it. what did Palo Alto look at that time? I mean, what, did, what did Palo Alto look like oh, at the time, oh. if you compare, compare it to what is now? Well, uh, it, you know, it was uh, a, a smallish college town. Yeah. It, it, Time. Yeah. And uh, most of what you see around the Stanford campus now, except for the main quad, was yeah. what was there. Okay. We were in uh, temporary World War II tilt up kind of buildings. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, anyone remembers the Stanford Electronics Laboratory? Yes, yeah, I do. Yeah. ERL. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, very little construction okay. around. Yeah. And uh, so the, the growth has just been, uh, been fantastic yeah. since then. The, the valley, of course, uh, you know, you could drive from here to San Jose uh, through, through orchards. Yeah. I mean, it was uh, you know, apricots and, and uh, walnuts and all kinds of, uh, of agriculture and wineries and such. But, uh, but no buildings, and of course, no, no Silicon Valley. Now, you know, I remember when I came here in 1962, I was working for IBM Research. I drove Blossom Hill Road to work, and it was Blossom Hill Road. Yes. I drove through Orchard. That's right. It was absolutely beautiful. That's right. And, and IBM, as you know, was set off down in way in South San Jose. Exactly, yes. Yeah. And was way out in the field. Exactly. It was, uh, exactly, in, in, in Orchard. And so it was only slightly uh, more uh, rural, uh, yeah. you know, in 57 when I first came. So you saw it yeah. in, in the beginnings as well. Yeah. And San Jose was just a very, very small town. You know, I wanted to ask you, then you're coming here as a young new professor, you're coming out to Stanford, there was nobody else here in control. And then, of course, you had to do some courses, but you also had to set up an agenda, I mean, both with respect to teaching and also with respect to the sort of research you were doing. Uh, what were the sort of things that were guiding you in that decisions, and how, how did it develop? Yeah, well, the, uh, 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 there were a couple of things about it. Um, the, as far as the research uh, areas were concerned, you know, I, I uh, for obvious reasons, continued to look at what I was doing at, uh, oh, yeah, at totally. Columbia. Yeah. You know, I continued looking at uh, uh, least squares yeah. estimation and, and, uh, and that yeah. sort of thing, extensions yeah. of that. Uh, and uh, the, the other part of that, which, which I must say, is, uh, I, I, I've just been quite lucky, I think, in my whole career. Uh, at that time, the major engineering centers in Stanford, because of Terman, was among those, uh, had what was called a joint services contract. Okay. Uh, 
during World War II, uh, there was, of course, this huge uh, uh, effort to develop radar yeah. at the Radiation Laboratory, yes, yes. And which was set up at MIT, yeah. but it collected uh, staff from yeah. all over the yeah. country, yeah. even all over the, the Allied world, I guess. Uh, and that, of course, was supported by the Defense Department, yeah. with, uh, from yeah. Vannevar Bush. Yeah. And, and uh, the Negro Bush, I guess I should say. But anyway, after the war, they, uh, uh, everyone agreed that, uh, that some of that should continue. Okay. And so they set up uh, what's called say, a joint services contract where the, the Navy, the ONR, typically was the lead uh, uh, agency, but the uh, Army and the Air Force. Okay. Okay. And the, the, from a personal point of view, what that meant was that when I came to Stanford, I didn't have to write any proposals at all. They immediately had available research uh, uh, segment. They just broke off a piece of that uh, department-wide research contract. Fantastic! <laughs> and, uh, and and so all of most essentially all of the department yeah. was able to support their research and their graduate students uh, under that uh, umbrella. So you just had a big sort of research candidate exactly. that you can just break off into that's, pieces. That's and right. Fantastic! The the, uh, the directors of yeah. the lab yeah. uh, at that time. Uh, uh, Bill Randall and yeah. Carl Spangenberg, and yeah. of course the main influence again still was Fred Sherman. Yeah. Uh, but they decided uh, on an annual basis, yeah. and we had a, a, there was a big annual research review. Yeah. Where the people from ONR yeah. and the other military folks would come yeah. out, and uh, we would make an all-day presentation, of, uh, and sometimes for two days, yeah. all the, uh, the research that had been going on. Mm. And that also, of course, meant that you could take a much more long-range attitude. Exactly. Exactly. You could uh, you could pick your topic yeah. and you just describe to them what it was you were going to do yeah. and, and take a long range, a long range view. And so, as I say, we were looking at uh, uh, in least squares control. Yes. And, and I also another problem that uh, that I uh, got a little support from NSF was um, looking at sensitivity, oh, yes. okay. which is you know is, is, you know part of the adaptive uh, oh, idea yeah. which was yeah. going on at that time. And uh, Bill Perkins did his thesis on that. Uh, oh, so Bill Perkins did his thesis here? Well, for me. Oh, insensitivity. I got oh, I started on oh, this sensitivity. Uh, and that, of course, became the main topic in Illinois for in many Illinois. years to come. That's oh, right. very he, I did. He, he took that back. And I know you quite well, but that was one fact I didn't know about yeah. before. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he, was, he did, his, uh, did his thesis on that. Yeah. I had another student who began looking at uh, the multivariable yeah. estimation, yeah. but we were still looking at it from the point of view of. Uh, of multivariable spectral analysis, yeah. you know, and uh, Roy Amara did a thesis on that, but then uh, Wiener and Masani wrote a paper yeah. on, on some of that, and, yeah. you know, I, my, I must admit my matrix uh, theory was not up it, to getting a really good solution. It is kind of hard to compete with Wiener. A little hard <laughs> to compete with, with yeah. Wiener and his, and his students yeah. as well. And then about that time, uh, Rudy Kalman and Dick Lucy yeah. came through. Okay. And uh, he had gone to riots yeah. that had been established. Uh, well, roughly when was that? This would have been 59. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so that was yeah. just at the time they had... Uh, they were just beginning. Well, you know, as Rudy has said, you know, he was, he was working on uh, getting a differential version of the wiener hoff equation. Yes, yes. And, and Lucy, Lucy was, uh, was differentiating the, the wiener hoff equation. Yeah. So yeah. the two of them realized they were, yeah. they were converging. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so they got together. Yeah. And, and they, they came out and gave a talk, and... Uh, both of them? Yeah, yeah, both of them came. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. And, uh, and so we had, we had some discussion about, uh, about uh, that sort of thing, and some of my students were in the, in the, in the audience. Yeah. And I suggested that uh, Herb Rausch look at the uh, smoothing problem. Yes, yes. And, uh, and, uh, and Tom Dunkel, yeah. who was, who was, who yes. was there, um, was looking at the, the combined control and estimation yeah. problem. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and I remember in his case, I uh, can't remember which day it was, sort of a Eureka, he came down again to his regular weekly appointment and says, I think I can do it. Yeah, okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah. And this was, of course, was the, was the separation, yeah, separation the, theory. theory. It was yeah. the idea yeah. of the certainty equivalence yeah. or whatever the term is. I wasn't familiar with Herb Simon's work as no, no, but, no. but, uh, but uh, the idea of combining yeah. the uh, control and estimation and making Complete uh, yeah. package. So that was pretty exciting. It was pretty exciting. Was Herb Rausch working at Lockheed at the time, or did he still? Did he, or no, he, when he finished his thesis, he was went to work for, okay. for, for okay. Lockheed, yeah. and there he met uh, uh, Striebel. Oh yes, yes, you know, yeah. and yes. Frank Tom. Yeah. And they and they actually wrote up the uh, the more complete yeah. uh, yes the smoothing stuff. But they, but all the smoothing algorithms Herb had done in his thesis. Yeah. Okay.
Now remember this, I was sharing an office, I was in the same corridor as Frank Tang when he was at IBM. Was it was at IBM? Yes. Yeah, I, I, so you came to, to I came IBM? here. I think I came here. I came here in 1962. 62. Because yeah. I well, remember Jack brought yeah, you up. Jack brought to, me. Uh, I think that was the first time, first time I met we you. Met, yeah. So then, and so I, I really said, and friends. you know, Jack was telling me a lot about you know what was being done at Columbia and the, the, the kind of things. And he was very yeah. kind to introduce me to to the people around the Bay Area. So I, was, I still yeah. remember this the first time I met you. Yeah. Yeah. And also there was uh, was it Winter was also here. I think. I also met Winter here when he was doing this uh, yeah. ADA lines, the adaptive That's right. neurons. That's right. That's Did right. you have much interaction with him during that time? Uh, not much. Okay. Some. Okay. He, okay. he and I uh, taught a joint seminar with, with graduate students okay. on sort okay. of the adaptive control yeah. and looking at yeah. uh, different things. Bernie, you know, had done his thesis at MIT for John Lindvall's twin brother. Oh, Bill Lindvall. Bill Lindvall. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and Bill had come out here after John. Yeah. And then he recommended that uh, that Bernie be involved okay, because okay. he knew that yeah. he was a, a smart guy. Yeah, yeah. And so so Bernie came out yeah. at that time yeah. and was uh, was as you say working on, uh, on adaptive yeah. uh, linear things. Yeah. His Adeline logic yeah. and the uh, linear separation idea in uh, digital logic. Uh, then, you know, uh, I mean, certainly we all are admiring, I mean, all the beautiful work you've done to write nice textbooks. But you must have some ideas when you came here to Stanford, you know, how you were going to develop the control curriculum, how you were going to sort out what material to teach and things like this. Uh, so when you came here, you had one course in control. Yeah, well, well that's right. There was a, when I came here, there was an introductory course in control, yeah. you know, that had uh, been around for, for some time. Uh, you know, using who had been teaching that? Uh, it was a graduate student, Fred yes, Gertzler. Okay, okay. And he ended up doing his thesis for me. So I see. Yes. Okay. To, uh, yep. Fred was sort of a professional student. Yeah, okay. He was around for a good long time, okay. teaching okay. teaching yeah. classes yeah. And, and this yeah. sort of thing. But it was not in the hands of any faculty. There was okay. no one okay. on the faculty okay. who were were teaching any control at all. So I taught when I first came here. As I remember, I, I taught you know three courses in in control, sort of the introductory control, yeah. and then uh, linear continuous, yeah. uh, more advanced control, and then the sample data okay. um, material. And uh, and I was working on the book with with Ragazzini yeah. on, uh, on 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 sample, sample data. data, yeah, yeah, and uh, and then just continued on uh, teaching, working up notes and having my ideas, but mainly using uh, the book by Ogata, oh, yeah. other yeah. You know, introductory yeah. uh, control books. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then, considerably later, decided that I really wanted to update the sample data stuff, because yeah. there was a lot of the, the state space yes. and things that uh, were not in the, the magazine. Yeah. And uh, at that time, uh, David Powell was teaching a course on uh, autopilot. Okay, in, in the aero department. In the aero department. Okay. Yeah. And, and I suggested that uh, rather than just making it autopilot, he ought to make it a more advanced course on sample data control. Yeah. And so we began a collaboration at that point. Okay. And uh, worked out and, and did a uh, did our first book okay. yeah. on, on digital yeah. control. And uh, and I was getting less and less satisfied with, uh, with Ogawa yeah. and, and the textbooks that yeah. were around yeah. and, and decided to uh, set out to make uh, an introductory textbook. Okay. Yeah. And, and again, I asked Powell if he would uh, assist yeah. and he agreed to. So okay, we, so yeah. the good teamwork continued. Good, that's yeah. right. And so we, we worked out the, uh, the introductory yeah. uh, textbook. But, uh, we but now to go back and just remind me again of something else. I, again, I don't know the exact date, but it was fairly early on in my uh, time here, maybe 1961 or two, that uh, Bob Cannon joined the Aero Astro Department. Okay, okay. And uh, he and I shared an office. That is to say, we had a suite of two offices oh, yeah. with a secretary, secretary. space okay. in between. Okay, yeah. Over in the old uh, ERL. Yeah. So he, but he was in Aero Astro. And you he were was in Aero Astro, yeah. and I was an electrical engineer. Okay. Okay. But one of the uh, very nice features of Stanford, I think, yeah. is that the departmental boundaries are, are, are very low. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and so there was no problem of a professor of Air West or sharing an office in yeah. the electrical engineering yeah. building. Perfect. Yeah. And uh, we had students uh, yeah. together. Yeah. I had Aero students. Yeah. He had uh, AE students. Yeah. The, the, the distinction was the qualifying exam. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. those were seven. 
But uh, Bob and I got together and laid out the uh, the, the content there. You know, the first course decided, for example, to teach the root locus first rather than the frequency response. Okay. First. Okay. okay. That uh, that you would go from the, from the time yeah. domain and then and then the frequency domain. And Bob had worked at uh, North America with Walt Edwards. Oh, I see. Oh, they created the so root he, locus. So he knew yeah. the, the root locus yeah. stuff, and yeah. he was very familiar with that. And uh, so that was how we organized uh, the, the original material. And then Bob wrote sort of the preliminary material. The, yeah. you know, his book, you've seen his book on system dynamics. Yes, I have, yes, yeah. Like the, yeah. Big, yeah, big, thick book. Yeah. Thick book on. That was the preliminary course simply because mechanical engineers typically were not prepared for control the way the W's no. were. The W's had this okay. year of circuit yeah. analysis, you know, system theory yeah. of signals. Yeah. They were very familiar with Fourier transforms yeah. and all that, yeah. which the mechanicals were not. Yeah. And uh, so that's how that was. But anyway, we later on, Dave and I, Powell and I got together and did the uh, introductory book. You know, do you think there's something we can learn from that today and in the future? I mean, if you look at the control field right now, I mean, there's a lot of subspecialities in and I mean, at that time, yeah. you were getting together with, uh, uh, with, with Bob Cannon from Arrows, and that had a major impact how you shaped this course. Do you think there That's is something true. we could learn about this today? Well, uh, I think, okay, we at Stanford d deliberately made a decision not to have a, a Department of Control, yeah. Oh, yeah. which was more common in Europe, yeah. I believe. You, yeah. Lund, uh, you went back, I believe, yeah. as, uh, as head of, uh, yes. as professor of control yes. Yes. at uh, the Lund Institute. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but rather, we felt that uh, we would retain from the classical department yeah. structure, but permit a lot of a lot of interaction, a lot of interaction, yeah. a lot of, and a lot of uh, cross fertilization yeah. among yeah. students as yeah. well as faculty. Yeah. As I say, Bob and I shared an office. Yeah. Then, when uh, the new building up the Duran building yeah. was constructed, uh, we were there as long as, as well as the guidance and control people. Yeah. So, so we continued to to share the geographic space in a way that was uh, very productive. Uh, so, the thing that I can that I would say that is to be learned from that is that uh, control is very much an interdisciplinary or an enabling kind of yeah. uh, kind of technology. It's something we've commented on this before. It's it's found in electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, aeronautics, and astronautics. Uh, even some of the civil engineering, an earthquake yeah. uh, stuff. Yeah. There's uh, control and system theory ideas are, are relevant there. So the main thing I would say is that we should we should continue to uh, to encourage this kind of interaction and uh, weak disciplinary boundaries so that uh, the, both the source of problems for control and the, uh, and the people interested in control can, with different backgrounds yeah. can bring different expertise yeah. to bear on the problem. I think that brings us to another issue. Uh, what do you think about the future? I mean, uh, I mean if you look at Stanford right now, it's, uh, uh, you have retired and Stephen yes. Boyd is mostly into optimization. So, yes. so what do you think about the future of control? Well, it's an interesting uh, question, of course, and one that, uh, that I've uh, pondered a little bit. Um, I remain optimistic that uh, control will find its way, and it will continue to be uh, an important uh, discipline. Uh, one domain which uh, is still foggy for me, but I would like to uh, get your views on this as well. Uh, Stanford has mapped out a very important uh, path in the future in the biological area, yeah. biomedical area. And that's always been a strange field to me. You know, there are departments of biomedical engineering or bioengineering yeah. in various places. And I've never been, frankly, very particularly impressed with the, either the quality of the work or the nature of the problem. But Within individual departments, you know, in the mechanical engineering department, for yeah. example, there's biomechanics, exactly. which is uh, which is quite good work and quite important. Uh, and there there must be other 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 in other individual domains. I have a young student, you know, she's not so young anymore, but at the University of Washington now, working in the genome project, okay, okay. using control uh, techniques in, in some of the analysis of uh, some of this. Uh, serial chemical process control that yeah. they have to do. Yeah. It's a micro, she has a micro process lab that, uh, that they're uh, constructing there to, 
to do this. Uh, Can you elaborate? Task. I think that sounds very. Could you elaborate a little bit about this? What she's doing and the sort of problems she's looking for. Is she doing sort of analysis lab where a lot of yeah, yeah, stuff right. about it? Yeah, that's right. They okay. they they put a, a little a test tube. You know, it's about the size of a large hypodermic needle. Yeah. yeah. Right. And they put a little material in that, and they inject things, and they shake it. Okay. 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 And then they warm it up, and then they okay. cool it down. It's, okay. just, it's just a whole sequence. Okay. It's just like a, a serial batch process, okay. really. But they have to control each of oh, these yeah. steps yeah. To, to a precise thing. So it's, it's like a small chemical it's process. It's like a small chemical yeah. process, yeah. you know. But instead of being a half a mile long, it's it, it's about uh, three feet long. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, and and they come out with uh, some conclusions at the end, maybe something ready for a, a chromatograph yeah. or something okay. like that okay. that will give the uh, final uh, uh, final breakdown. And then she's using uh, it's a whole combination of sort of mechanics, uh, robotics, okay. control, and, and, and systems. I don't think there's much uh, I don't see much what you might call deep system per, per se. Yeah. But but her background in control and, and looking at things from the point of view of a system and. and Knowing how to handle these simple feedback uh, in a very uh, convenient and, and, and cost-effective way was, was very important to the project. Uh, Stanford has recently been given a huge gift by Jim Clark, you know, from uh, from Silicon Graphics, yeah. um, something like 150 million dollars okay. for support of uh, bio interaction between medicine school and the, bio and the engineering school. So. <laughs> and. Uh, where that's going to go is is uncertain now. People are looking at it, and, and where control is, what role control is going to play, uh, is uh, to my mind unknown. We have a lot of medical imaging, yeah. for example, yeah. and again, that's that's a lot of system theory and transform analysis and so on. There's not much feedback uh, per se. You know, I could think. I mean, I'm convinced that in the body there is a fantastic collection of feedback and mechanisms. No question about that. I mean, they're that. Everything. Oh, they're governing everything. Oh, absolutely, governing everything. Oh, yes. And and um, uh, I think it would be quite interesting to see. And they will certainly have a big influence. You know how we feel and how we live and all that kind of thing. So, so I think fee uh, the idea of feedback is extremely important in the biological system. And I haven't seen much detailed work. Where people are looking at this and exactly, exactly. And of course, it's a difficult area. I mean, it's it's, it's complicated. It's messy. Yeah. It's complicated. Yeah. That's right. But uh, there's no question. You know, everything from uh, uh, you know oxygen, uh, blood sugar, yeah. blood pressure, yeah. all these things. Balance. Temperature. Yeah. Balance. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. They're mechanical, chemical. It's, we're 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 a, a regular factory. Feedback, so if I interpret you right, you have a sort of cautious optimism when it comes to control. I think that's, I think that's is right. That more or less right. That's right. No? And and you know, in, in other areas, yeah. uh, right now at Stanford, uh, I would say that the um, greatest level of excitement and, and intensity of, of activity and so on is surrounds the whole uh, GPS system, the global positioning system. Oh, yeah. The idea of uh, that that you could now locate objects uh, to very great accuracy yep. anywhere on the Earth. Yeah. I heard that you have just released uh, uh, the encryptation of the last bits of the GPS tool. Yes, I just heard that announcement yeah. that, the, yeah. that the Defense Department have uh, discontinued yes. uh, the, uh, uh, the noise, yeah. the, the, the encryption yeah. of the accuracy. And, and so uh, now people can get uh, uh, a receiver that would give their position within uh, within meters, yeah. and using differential GPS, they can get this down to centimeters. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a big project, for example, in agriculture, okay. where uh, a farmer with a thousand acres uh, has very different types of soil and conditions, okay. and so the uh, treatment that you would give to it on everything from fertilizers okay. to pesticide depends on where you are. Oh, I see. Okay, so okay. so, so, so you, with GPS, yeah. you can map out his domain, okay, and you can automatically have your uh, your spreader uh, putting out the right combination of, uh, of nutrients, okay, uh, according to where where it's located. Fantastic. Okay. And, uh, and and so there there such application as that, and, and that's using the the GPS system and and feedback yeah. to. Uh, to control yeah. this, uh, this. Oh, there's some control people are involved in this project. So this oh yes, yep. there are a lot of control okay. people involved in this project. The uh, the guru of the whole thing is Brad Parkinson, right? Okay. Who sort of started the GPS or yeah. was a manager for it when he was in the Air Force. Yeah, and he's not Stanford. He's not Stanford. Yeah. 
and and he is directing uh, yeah. directing that. Uh, so so there's a, there's a lot of, of, of activity and interest in that. And then uh, this uh, young woman who's just joined the Air Master Department. Uh, another area that I think is, is, is critical is one that she's working on. Uh, from a theoretical point of view, it's, it's what we call hybrid control. Oh, yeah. the, the interaction of logic yeah. with differential equations. Yeah. Uh, we've known that a lot. Yeah. I, I yeah. remember hearing a seminar at Lund, as a matter of fact, yeah. from, uh, I, I believe it was Egbert, what was the, the, the one who went uh, into a company to form the... Uh, Self-tuning regulator. Oh, yeah. That commercial. was uh, Gunnar Benson. Gunnar, Gunnar Benson. Benson. Yeah, yeah. But I, I remember... Well, Maybe I remember, it was Bo Egan. It was Bo Egan. Bo Egan. That, that's yes, who, yes, I, that's yeah. who I heard. Bo Egan. Yeah. My, my yeah. recall system is <laughs> being delayed. Anyway, um, I remember he was describing the self-tuning regulator, which, of yeah. course, we were yeah. all... The equations of which we were all familiar with. And someone asked him, okay, in this commercial product, what fraction yeah. of your software is a self-tuning regulator? Yeah. And he thought of it and he said, I think, as I recall, it's something like 5%. Yeah. You know, the rest of it is all this logic yeah. and making sure that everything is yeah. right. And man-machine interfaces. Man-machine yeah. interfaces yeah. and all yeah. this other stuff. Yeah. And, and, and the control field has only recently begun to, I think, take a real account yeah. of that. It's always been sort of heuristic yeah. and sort of embedded yeah. and, and we sort of work with it. But to get a theory out of it. And what uh, Claire Tomlin is looking at is uh, is in aircraft control, yeah. you know the air aircraft controller, the whole yeah. the whole business where yeah. you, you you have the dynamics of yeah. the airplane, yeah. which is obviously yeah. continuous yeah. and is a uh, full of uh, classical control yeah. style. Uh, but then you have all this other logic, you know, or how close are you to this other airplane? Uh, how close are you to uh, to your airport yeah. or to weather? Yeah. And all sorts of other yeah. other kinds of logic and, and things that can go wrong and things that uh, that go right. And how you analyze that, how you guarantee the stability of that, how you guarantee the convergence of that, how you guarantee that it uh, comes out the way yeah. you wish it to. I think this is a, a, a very important field for the future, that control is going to be making some contributions. You know, uh, touching upon this, of course, there's another area we mentioned computer, and that is the, the relations between control and computer science. You mentioned that early on in your career, I mean, you were really a circuits and analog man to start with. That's right. Uh, and sure. now, uh, uh, and that was the tools you had to use to implement the control systems and to simulate. Yeah. Uh, so, what is your view on the relation between control and computer science? Uh, I must say it's 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 uh, at a distance. Okay. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, that is to say, obviously, um, the explosion of the use of, uh, say, digital control, yeah. which uh, you know has followed my career from the start. Uh, has been enabled by the computer business. Yeah. The fact that now you can use a signal processor to control disk drives yeah. and all this other stuff. Yeah. So, so we make a great use of that, and it's, it's enabled the applications of some of this theory. And sort of calculations that you can make, which we, in, in the time of our theses, or my thesis anyway, <laughs> uh, you wouldn't consider them. I, I remember you must have seen the uh, ASP, the Automatic Synthesis Program. Yes, yes. <laughs> volume yes. that... Yes. Uh, Engler and uh, yeah, Kalman put out, put out yeah, you know, yeah. where they were solving Riccardi equations with assembler language. I yeah. mean, it was, it was unbelievable. It was unbelievable, that's right. And, uh, and now, you know, you get it in a little pension and bang, it's done. Yeah, and the, of course, the other thing is the software. Yeah. MATLAB, yeah. the MathWorks, the yeah. things that uh, Cleve Motor and, uh, and Jack Little had done, have had a major impact. I mean, you were one of the pioneers in computer-aided design, of course, with the... Uh, the Moon Suite, uh, whatever you call it, Simnon. Uh, but nowadays, that sort of thing is available to everybody yeah. through, uh, yeah. uh, through the math maps. Do you think that control engineers in general uh, learn enough about software and computing in school? But do you think that oh. software engineers who are going through the field learn enough about real time? Or is that an area we should well, pay some attention to? My, uh, it's... That's, that's been sort of a, a controversy, yeah. I think, right along. To be no, that's what I'm you. asking. <laughs> yes, uh, that's, that's right. My own view, as, as, as just reflecting my own skills, I suppose, uh, has been uh, not to get too much into the uh, detailed yeah. Uh, yeah. computer yeah. Uh, programming software. Yeah. Uh, you know, we did interfaces for our yes. controls lab yeah. and, and some simple yeah. things uh, yeah. in simple languages, usually in basic yeah. Yeah. and so on. Uh, and... and uh, I guess I'm arrogant enough to say that I think that the control engineers 
they learn the programming they need yeah. <laughs> better than I find the computer scientists are able to learn the control and system theory. Okay. Uh, so so uh, I still feel that, that the control uh, is the is the foundation discipline, if you please. So maybe we but should then make sure that comp computer scientists are learning a little bit more about control. I wish that we could yeah. make sure that they do, they, but they seem to avoid it like yeah. the play. Yeah. You know, I mean, at Stanford, for, yeah. Yeah. at Stanford, for example, they have cut uh, considerably back on the uh, uh, amount of physics that they require yeah. computer scientists yeah. to take, yeah. and they've cut back on the amount of engineering that they require yeah. computer scientists yeah. to take. They take uh, the only engineering that the computer scientists are required to take now is the very introductory sophomore uh, electronics course. Okay. Everything else is it's software. Taking, okay. yeah. uh, and I think that's a shame. Yeah. In, 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 but uh, they just feel they have so much software yes. to, yeah, so much, uh, to learn. So much new things to learn. Yeah. Something has to do. But, uh, but they don't know uh, much about the differential equations. They do robotics. Yeah. And it's, it's all uh, sequences of yeah. things. They just go slowly enough that the dynamics never yeah. get in the way. Or they hire some control engineer to uh, provide the feedback. Uh, in a way, that's, that's, that's too bad. Now, that brings us to uh, another topic that you are better informed on than I. I'd like to, to turn the table, if you please, Carl. And that is on the, the whole business of fuzzy control and, uh, and neural networks. Uh, the neural networks, uh, presumably, probably by the name and otherwise, is, is it, in, in some sense a mimic of uh, the, way, uh, the way nervous systems are put together, although I think that, uh, that connection is, is, is broken very early on in, uh, in, the, uh, in the discipline. But what influence or what role do they play in, in the control, and to what extent are the control engineers to study those things? <laughs> Well, you know, if, if it comes to, you ask me about neural networks, I think it's an extremely simplistic model of what a neuron really is. Because in a neural network, all neurons are the same. We all know in biological systems, they are certainly not the same. And the functions in them are much more, much more sophisticated in the biological system. Uh, but I do think there is, a, so I view neural network as, a, it certainly is a convenient way to um, uh, describe a function of many variables by essentially doing compositions of simpler functions. Mm -hmm. So I think that if you're going to describe a function of many variables, the underlying idea would be to have the neural network structure is quite an economical one to describe the functions. And also that you have a learning mechanism for it. So in my mind, it's a, a component which is a, a non-linear function with a learning mechanism. And we certainly can have, you know, good use of these kind of things. Uh, but then on the other hand, I mean, there are some people who believe that you can do anything with neural networks. And I think it's very dangerous to have just one tool and yeah. believe that you can apply it to, to everything. And of course, fuzzy is something that we can discuss a long <laughs> time about. And, and my view is that um, uh, very often, uh, in many cases where fuzzy control has been given a credit, I think that it's really feedback that should have given a credit. You know, yeah. you take something yeah. where you've not been using sensors before and then you create a, a feedback system out. And I don't think it matters very much what particular technique you have done. Yeah. And many of the success areas of FASI have certainly been in that area. On the other hand, I think that one thing where I think FASI is very useful, if you have a manual operating practice and you're going to translate this to a machine, I think FASI is a very good language to do this kind of thing. So, yeah. so I think you, or, know, or you know the control algorithm exactly. beforehand, yeah. but you yeah. want to make a yeah, or you know how you human, human or does it. So yeah. I, I think yeah. there are useful techniques, but yeah. there has been a little bit too much hype about that. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. You're preaching to the choir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we certainly but, agree uh, on that. Yes, <laughs> sure. Okay. <clears throat> Can I interject a couple of questions? Oh, sure. 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 Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I mentioned this before. I'm curious, and this is open to, yeah. to both of you, um, the, the effect of having ubiquitous sensors and ubiquitous actuators and ubiquitous computing, I mean, it, a lot of control problems can become trivial you know, if you can do state space control on them, yeah. you're, not, you're not doing state estimation now because yeah. you put a sensor on every yeah. state. Um, do, you, do you see that changing the way control is taught uh, as, as highly, very inexpensive sensors and very inexpensive actuators become available? Computation is free, essentially. Uh, let me uh, speak to that first then. My, my sense of it is that... Uh, Problems are like a gas. They expand to fill the available space. That is to say, at any given time, with, with small computers now, we can solve problems that we couldn't even think of back in the, in the 50s. 
So, so we solve other problems that, that, that we couldn't. And as, as the technology develops, as you say, we get cheap sensors and so on, uh, I'm confident that the complexity of the problems will continue to grow. That people will still need to know the, the, the concepts of, uh, of control and estimation and reconstructing things from, uh, from uncertain data and, and such like. But wherever you can get uh, more sensors or more, uh, more, more actuators, sure, they should be applied and they will be applied. Whether any, to what extent new theory would say be, be called for, or new control approaches would be called for by that, uh, is more difficult for me to for me to say. I, from what I've seen, the only the, the area that I have seen where something new is done is, is in this hybrid area, where the thing the problem is such that you have an interaction between uh, digital logic, say, and uh, a dynamic system. Then you need you need new theories, but that's a that's a qualitative change in the kind of system that's being considered, not just a quantitative change in the numbers of sensors or the numbers of actuators. Yeah, I think I can take this as a slightly different takeoff on that. And I think this whole area, I think you can call it sensor-rich control, or you can also call it actuator-rich control. And I think it has some implications on the education because I think we must pay much more attention to, to uh, multivariable systems and many inputs and many outputs. And I also think that you have to pay much more attention to diagnostics because once you start to exploit all the sensors, you must have some kind of way of dealing with a situation where one of the sensors is failing and things like this. And I've seen a couple of very interesting examples lately. I just came from a, a meeting on pulp and paper control up in Canada where they are doing cross-directional control of paper machines. And they have something like uh, several hundred control variables where they are adjusting, you know, the thickness and the moisture of the paper around it. And they have sensors which give you a resolution corresponding to something like, you know, 700 sensors and things like this. And um, that's certainly different. I mean, the sort of issues you have to deal with when you're doing that are um, uh, certainly an order of magnitude more complicated than the sort of things we have in normally dealing with. I know another area that I've been a little bit concerned with lately have been in the biomedical area where people are using spectroscopic sensors. So, you know, you have, you know, Raman spectra, you have near infrared, and you're getting the equivalence of having something like 20,000 sensors. And then you're going to use them to control, you know, what they do in the drug industries, for example, they are making, you know, pills and things like this. And with the spectroscopic method now, you can actually analyze both the chemical structure and the the geometric structure of these things. And both of them are important for the way the pills are working. You take a pill and then it's sitting in your stomach for a while, it's being transported a little bit down into your system. And that's why you would like to have the release of the drug. And so now you have this, you can now start to measure things. You couldn't dream about measuring before. But we have this, you have, when you have 20,000 measurements, you know, mm. that's a different that's ball true. game. Yeah. And uh, then you have to control in, in the, uh, the, the control process. Maybe you only have uh, something like 20 control variables. And what these people are using is that some kind of statistical techniques called PLS partial least squares, where they try to, it's in a certain sense very similar to, to, to filtering. And they try to find, among these uh, old measurements you can do, there's a lot of correlations. You try to unscramble the correlation then and maybe get out some, some numbers, maybe uh, 100, maybe 50, which are characterizing what they're doing. And these are certainly bringing new techniques in there. And in all these problems, you're computer limited. Because, I mean, if you take, now you speak about, you know, processing, you know, 20,000 20, signals, for example. That's a very major thing. I could also think about another area of similar nature. That is when you start to do, use video cameras as sensors. Then, you know, video cameras are becoming a sort of universal, cheap, general sensor for many, many things. So now when you have the images that are coming out of this, you're going to use them for control. You certainly need to to understand much more about how to deal with images. And then, of course, the issue is, should you just operate on the image as it is? Should you, you know, transform it to some kind of state? So I think there are some very interesting problems in that area to deal with. That's, that's, that's interesting. And in fact, you know, um, I'm not quite sure how relevant it might be to the controls, but there's a, an interesting project going on here yeah. in, uh, in digital cameras in which the, uh, uh, the investigators are doing uh, pixel by pixel pre-processing, so they have they have uh, little uh, I think it's eight uh, uh, four bit something like that uh, uh, A to D converter yeah. on each pixel. Yeah. So that so that you can do pre-processing yeah. before you even send the data back. Yeah. And and by by uh, by, by that procedure, they're doing all this yeah. in parallel. Yeah. They can greatly increase the frame rate. Yeah. 
so they can get many more uh, many more frames uh, per second than you can with the modern CCD camera, where you have to do a serial yeah. readout yeah. of each little bit yeah. on each pixel. Oh, fantastic. So, uh, so there are a lot of uh, device uh, developments that are going on there, and and uh, it may be that in a given circumstance, such as your uh, yeah. your uh, pill yeah. fabrication yeah. Or, or whatever, uh, there might be some special processing you'd yeah. like to be able to do. Something besides just simply get out the, uh, the range. Might be some spec to make set one set of pixels more sensitive to certain uh, colors yeah. than others. Yeah. I don't know. There, there are lots of possibilities. Reminds me of another thing, you know, Carver Reed here at Caltech has been doing, and he's been doing analog VLSI. And he's been doing some very creative devices where he has, um, uh, he's doing eyes, for example. And then in this eye, he's also building in processing. So he can have, you know, he can have motion detectors directly based on the analog silicon. And since he does it in analog, you know, it's extremely, it's highly parallel. Yeah, and, and very fast. Extremely fast, and you can also go over very, very large sensitivity levels. So, so I think there are some very exciting yes. levels in there. Yeah. So maybe that's our future. Could they be? Could they be? Yeah, speaking of that, are there? Do you see any um, internet, cell phone, uh, digital television type analogs for the control world that that spur uh, an explosion of the use of control? In the same way that you know, wanting to transmit pictures across the internet or wanting to uh, have uh, you know uh, digital HD TV broadcasts have spur uh, really you know spurred on the fields of compression and uh, uh, communications, right? at least from an industrial perspective. I think I can start. You see, I think what uh, what has really contributed to this explosion of the internet and the cell phone is that it's a commodity that every person can use. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so, so you really get a fantastic mass scale out of this. I mean, it was mm -hmm. certainly the same with the telephone. And uh, uh, one thing that has an analog of that, which has a strong control component, is this kind of thing people are referring to as intelligent houses. I mean, in other words, you start to get cheap devices into your house which are doing things for you. Mm -hmm. And I think certainly in that area, I mean, uh, there will be you know, quite a bit of feedback in and I also think that in, in the internet area, uh, I think, if, for example, the design of protocols, feedback can certainly play a big role in that area. Mm -hmm. Because uh, uh, if you look at how do you deal with the, the traffic congestion, and I mean, what do you deal with the messages where they don't get through, I mean, that's certainly a very complicated control mm -hmm. problem. And one of the beauties about the TCP IP is that they have an extremely interesting feedback mechanism where the messages don't go through in that, which is, has mm -hmm. been tremendously effective. Mm -hmm. And I know in cellular telephone, there are a lot of feedback control problems. I actually have a lot of my PhD students are actually working for Ericsson and Nokia. And uh, you have things like uh, game control. You, you know, if you're close to a station, you, would, you, can, you can lower your, your, your games. Mm -hmm. And that had a tremendous impact on, on battery power and things like this. So I think in this whole area, there's a lot mm -hmm. of, there's a lot of communications problems like compression and stuff like this. But there is also a whole collection of feedback problems, which I think we should really try to, to explain much more to, to our students what they are. How about, Carl, how about the, uh, in the transportation as well? I think I'm saying like, like the, the private automobile, you mentioned oh, yeah. about yeah. The traffic, yeah. uh, just the, the, the conventional definition of traffic comes yeah. to my mind, not, not just internet traffic, yeah. but uh, street traffic. Yeah. Uh, you know, people now have, uh, I, I, when I drive around the town, there are obviously some traffic lights that are that are uh, uh, traffic dependent. Yeah. You know, they, they stay green longer if yeah. there are more cars coming, yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. That's about the most primitive kind of uh, feedback that you could you could think of. But suppose you try to, to control the traffic in San Jose yeah. or San Francisco or San Francisco. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know of anyone that's really looking at that from the point of view of a, of a, of a control ideal over the whole uh, over the whole region. But uh, it, it might have a possibility. We can now, with the communications, we can certainly get the information back. It comes back to, to having sensors. One can now presumably you get the yeah, sensors. With GPS. I mean, the GPS in every car. Well, that, that's right. And well, increasingly, there are some cars that have GPS automatically now. You know, I was in Tokyo. So, I was in Tokyo at the beginning of this year. In Tokyo, right now, it's very common to have this instance where you have uh, you have a map on your car and you're punching where you're going to go. Then in Tokyo, they've added another feature. They, they get local feedback about traffic flow. So on this map, you can see which roads are blocked. Yeah. So, so they, uh, then, then the driver can himself then avoid 
Uh, and we're in the routing algorithms, they are actually taking into account the fact that some the congestion, congestion, the, the congestion of it. Yeah. I also know that in Amsterdam, uh, Van Schuppen in Amsterdam, he has been having a very long range program to work in Amsterdam to try to regulate traffic and quite successfully. Mm. So I think that may actually be bigger. And if you look at traffic in San Francisco, like I did this morning, yes. it's badly needed. It is, it and I think it, it, this would be fantastic. In, uh, this would be something that every person would think would be very useful if we do it right. And, and you, you mentioned GPS in the car. Yeah. Obviously, automobiles are becoming increasingly controlled devices yeah. as aircraft have yeah. been for some time. Yeah. But now, you know, they're getting automatic controls in the engine, for yeah. pollution control yeah. and, and, and performance, uh, and, and, and other other kinds of functions. Obviously, climate control yeah. has been uh, doing that for a while. But yes, GPS, the yeah. thing that they're doing in Tokyo, where they don't have yeah. numbered streets no. uh, <laughs> no. and so on. Uh, there are many things that one could uh, could imagine, could, uh, could contribute to that. And maybe intercity travel as well. I mean, now you listen to your radio and you hear that I-80 is blocked right. and so you might try some other way back from Tahoe. You know, in Sweden they are trying an interesting scheme right now to make people obeying the speed rules. They are installing a device in your car which breaks it down to the legal speed the legal limit, limit when you enter the zone. <laughs> So they were announcing for some volunteers to have these devices installed in their cars and if you sit it. But I think that's a that's a use of feedback that I'm not quite sure it will it will gain general acceptance. How many volunteers in, in, don't in, that? Yeah. In, in this land of gun owners, there's yeah. no way you, you're no. gonna you're gonna put something uh, that will break the car. No. <laughs> but uh, but the information, the idea exactly. of being able to provide information yeah. and provide feedback, it seems to me is uh, is another exciting area that uh, can, can be uh, useful, be, will, will be followed by yeah. control engineers. Yeah. Okay. Great.